Well, hey, everyone, I uh, hope you enjoyed those songs as much as we did as, as we were singing those and just proclaiming those together. Um, today, we are uh, starting uh, another conversation together. Um, we started it last week, and we just felt like we said in the welcome, it just wasn't over yet. And um, my name is Trey Kreitzer. I'm the campus pastor and uh, teaching pastor here on staff, and I'm joined with our lead pastor, Jeff. And we've invited uh, two friends from our church to join us today, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves to you. But I really hope that you're, you're blessed by this conversation today. But I hope also that you're challenged by this conversation today as well, as we just talk about all the things that are going on in our world today and hear some different perspectives on how we can continue to be the church during this time. So guys, I want to pass it off to y'all. Introduce yourselves. Tell us a little bit about yourselves so we can all kind of get to know you a little bit. Definitely. Hello, everyone. My name is AJ Nwoko. Uh, if, if you go to Atlee Church, you may have seen me kind of working the cameras um, in the back there making these services possible. But when I'm not doing that, um, I am a member of the press. I work for NBC 12 News in, in Richmond. And, uh, and yeah, um, I'm, I'm just glad to be here today um, with you guys to have this conversation. And soon to be married? Oh, yeah, and soon to be married. I, uh, I'm engaged. Yeah, that's important, right? Yeah, that, yeah. that is, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm happily engaged. Uh, my fiance Lauren, is likely watching right now, and, and, uh, and I'm, I'm glad that um, in many ways this church is going to help make that that um, ceremony possible. And uh, wow, less than almost 100 days now to go. Wow, you know, you're uh, counting uh, you know, days. Less than Very four good. months. Yeah, down. So. <laughs> I get the, the privilege of uh, officiating that wedding, yeah, so. and I'm uh, looking forward to that. That's going to be awesome. That's Thank cool. you for that. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Julian Charity. And, uh, you know, I, I'm on the music team here in Adley, and you've probably seen me up here on stage. Uh, when I'm not doing that, uh, as AJ said, uh, I, am, uh, I work with Henrico County Recreation and Parks uh, in the history division. So I'm a historian by trade. I'm married. My wife, Brooke, and I have been married for four years now. We have a uh, two-year-old son named Jude. Hey, Jude. Uh, and we are expecting another son on July the 19th, so just a few weeks from now. Uh, so I'm uh, going to be expanding quite a bit. And yeah, another little boy. <laughs> <laughs> You're also an author. I learned I'm here also recently. Also an author. I've, I've two written, books? written two books. Is that right? Yeah, oh, right, man. Oh, that's cool. So, <laughs> Both these guys are fascinating. Back. There's so I much know. about their lives. Like that's just a little snippet of like how cool they are. Yeah. So, um, so as we uh, we begin this conversation, um, obviously we're all heavily involved, and in, you know, just when we think things are going well. You know, it seems like everything breaks loose again. I know you were busy yesterday. We were trying to get together last night to have a conversation, and, and AJ <laughs> ended up working yeah. long into the night last night covering the news. But uh, so speaking of that and current events, just uh, speak into how these current events are affecting you guys. Um, I'll say from my perspective, because I have a very interesting um, one, that being um, a part of the press, and, and going to these demonstrations and these protests and being in the thick of it um, and having to quickly adapt and change uh, to what the day brings. You know, today is completely different from yesterday and all the news that can happen in, in just a few hours and, and it totally just sucks the air out of a room and you have to adapt and focus. Um, I think we are at a moment of reckoning um, in, in this country um, in, in Virginia, uh, in, the, in the greater Richmond area. And uh, we're being faced with some, some ugly truths that, um, to be quite honest, many of us have kind of shied away from. We try to shy away from these conversations that really needed to be had a long time ago. And now we're faced with everything at once, um, and and now it's how do we come to terms with dealing with that in the right way, and uh, and how can we work together? Yeah. So, you know, if 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 uh, <laughs> it's funny, we have we're in the midst of a, still in the midst of a pandemic. So you know, there's that you know that that uneasiness, that anxiety of of what's to come, and then on the back you know coming out of that, or at least the things lessening, you know, you have civil unrest. And every day you turn on the news, there's something else, there's something else, there's something else. So it comes to a point where you kind of get tired of, of looking at AJ, AJ and like, <laughs> don't, you know, I don't, don't want to hear anything from him for a while. But it's, it, it, it has actually taken 
the country into a place where people are uneasy, they're uncomfortable, but at the same time, when does anything, any change ever come of anything that's easy or something that is comfortable? So it's that uncomfortable, you know, being uncomfortable is like, okay, I don't like feeling uncomfortable, so maybe I need to make a change or drive a change so that I can feel comfortable again. And that's, that's where we are right now. It's like, I, I want to feel comfortable again in my uncomfortability, if that's a word. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I can't tell you what an honor and a privilege it is to share the stage with these two guys, having served with both of them for a long time. But uh, we had a short conversation before this morning, uh, before we actually broadcast out back on the patio here at the church. And there should have been some like hidden cameras out there because yeah, that the, was so it was, good. Uh, so, so it'll be interesting to see how much we can get done in a short period of time. Yeah. But, um, but guys, one of the things, uh, questions I have for you is, is tell me. Have you ever had or experienced, you know, racism in your personal life? Um, yes, I've experienced it a lot of my life growing up in, in many different small ways. And I've always tried to kind of be better or bigger than those moments. Um, but being involved in, in the business that I am, uh, I was faced with two, and I'll just touch on them briefly. In Charlottesville, 2017, um, I actually had just started working in Richmond, but we had to drive back up to Charlottesville um, for not the Unite the Right rallies that everyone's really um, familiar with, but a month before that, there was a KKK rally in Charlottesville. And for the first time in my life, not a history book, I'm not looking at it on, on, on television, I'm staring at individuals in white hoods. It was me and another reporter. Um, she was also black. Wow. And we are staring in, in, at someone who, for no other reason, does not like me, does not like her, uh, and would not want anything to do with us, just for how we look. And it was very unsettling to be face to face with something that's still existing today. This was only three years ago. It's not like it went away. It didn't go away in the history books. It's, it's happening right now. And that was the first time I saw it so raw, so unfiltered. Um, uh, so, so there was that, but perhaps even more eye-opening was something that I experienced uh, a few years ago. I was doing a story, um, they, they told me to go to Charles City to cover a fire that happened the night before. And I'm driving down these back roads trying to get to my location. I have it in, in, in my Google Maps and I, I get taken down this dirt road and it says I'm, I'm maybe, you know, just a quarter of a mile away. I just need to continue on this dirt road. And when I drive down it, um, I find uh, like this weird construction equipment um, at, the, at the end of the road. And I'm, I'm like, I don't know if I can squeeze through that. Let me step out of my car, make sure that I've got enough clearance. And when I, when I step out of my car, there's a house on the side of the road. Uh, and a woman comes out and she's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, oh, well, you know, this probably does look odd. There's a news car out here and I'm, and I'm trying to see if I can get through. And I said, oh, hey, you know, my name's AJ Nwoko. I'm, I'm with the news. I don't care who you are. What are you doing here? And I'm like, I'm just trying to get to the location of this fire. She said, I saw you trying to touch my husband's stuff. You were touching his stuff. And I said, ma'am, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't touching his stuff. Um, I'm with the news. Prove it. Where's your identification? I said, I have, I have my ID here. There's my news card. There's the, there's the proof. I'm calling the police. You're trespassing. You were touching my husband's stuff. I know you're not with the news. Who's your supervisor? I said, I'll give you the number to our newsroom. And, and if you want to, you know, verify that I'm, that I'm really who I am. And long story short, she calls the police. Um, she acts fran frantically on the phone. She's videotaping me at the same time with, 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 with her other phone. And she's like, yeah, he's being very rude to me. He, he's threatening me. He's touching my husband's things. Um, and so I, had, I called the police <laughs> because I, I said, okay, if I leave, if I leave this moment right now, then all of a sudden it looks like I'm doing something wrong. I said, I'm not leaving. I'm not backing down. I'm, I'm just gonna stay right here. I called the police. Uh, uh, they, they eventually um, arrive and in the back of my mind, I was saying, 
please let this officer be on my side. And he comes out as, as an, uh, an African-American officer, and, and um, he kind of diffuses the situation and, and escorts me out, um, out of there. And, um, and he says, I'm sorry you had to go through that. He said, I'll, I'll, get you, I'll get you where you're trying to go. And that was the, an everyday person, you know, who had no reason to distrust me, no reason to assume I was a threat of any kind. Um, but because of the way I looked, you know. Even though I'm assuming yeah, you were driving a car, like I, I was you're driving, driving a car, down, I, Channel 12 you know, all over I the had, side. I had everything but the, uh, my blazer on, you know. Wow. So there, and, and she still thought that I was some kind of a threat uh, and that I was there for nefarious purposes. And that was the first time I was really, really faced with, it's not, that's not someone in a, in a hood. That's not, you know, you know, someone who's part of this, you know, radical group. That's, that's a woman who, who, who lives in a home in Charles City, you know, so. You know, AJ, that, that really hurts my heart because I was born and raised in Charles City County. Um, you know, I'm just a small town boy from South Charles City, but, um, yeah, the, yeah. Uh, but for me personally, I've, I've never had to experience standing in front of people with white hoods on and, but there are no one, and, and we talked about this earlier, AJ, no one is going to call you the N word anymore, but there are other ways of saying it. Uh, there are other ways of making a person feel less than what they are. And uh, just this past December, um, a colleague and I went to a conference in Middleburg, and we're walking through the town on one of our breaks. And both of us, you know, I'm you know, tall guy, he's shorter, opposite race, you know, quote unquote. But we're walking, and this, this lady walking towards us makes eye contact with me. And she decides that, you know, and he and I were kind of walking side by side of each other, then we would step to the side as somebody would come or a tree would be there. And she decided she was going to step out of the, off the sidewalk and walk around us and then get back on the sidewalk and keep walking up. But I, I've also been followed in stores. I've been walked into a store and felt that I was not welcome. Um, and I haven't gone back since. But one of, one of the things, one of the experiences I had that was really telling, because I really didn't notice it at first, but the person I was with did, my father-in-law and I were going on a mission trip to uh, North Dakota. We're going to Standing Rock Indian Reservation, and we were we drove. We we were the advance team. We drove and we drove. We're driving through North, South Dakota. We stopped in Aberdeen and went to um, a restaurant. We we're together and step in there, and immediately all the eyes turned around and looked at me, and. I really didn't pay attention to it. I'm, you know, first thing I always think, you know, me out being funny, I'm thinking, hey, they'd never seen a good-looking guy before. <laughs> um, but my father-in-law, he's like, wait, whoa, what's, what's this all about? You know, he's feeling, and we, he didn't say anything at first until we left. Once we left, he was like, man, I've never felt anything like that before in my life. And my father-in-law is white. So he was like, whoa. How, and it, it, to him, he was like, man, I'm, what is that like for you? You know, we started having that conversation. And I was like, you know, I got to the point now where I just kind of ignore it. I just move on because I've realized that some people don't want to get to know a great guy or a great person just because they have this preconceived notion of who I am or what I am or what people who look like me are. And, you know, it's one of those things that you kind of turn a blind eye to it, but now the way things are in our country, we, we can't. We can't anymore. Um, as, as a people, as whether you're black or white, if, if your friend is hurting or your, your family is hurting, you, you should feel that hurt too. And that's where we are now. I, you know, I'm kind of angry, but I'm not angry at a specific individual person. I love people. I do. But I do realize that there are bad representatives in every color, every uniform, um, every facet of life. So that's one of those things, just like with that one lady you encountered, it's like, everybody's not like that, but she is. Yeah, I, uh, I asked them to, to, I asked you that question because I, I want people to be able to connect 
with your world and what you experience. Because I think a lot of us do take for granted. Um, yeah, and we think, oh, that's, it's kind of isolated. It's not as big of but it's not isolated. I mean, it's, it is everywhere, and it is still obviously very prevalent in, in our country. And uh, as we're seeing um, nightly and, and even daily with the protests and all. So, so one of the things that, um, that everybody's asking for is, is change. And um, so, so we titled this Black and White. And let me just speak into this a moment. So uh, I, I titled this Black and White because I, I'm a black and white person, meaning I like everything. You know, I like things to be solid, you know, yes, no answers, and I don't like maybes, I don't like gray areas, uh, but when it comes to where we're at right now, this isn't just a black and white issue, uh, and by that I'm not talking about just the color of our skin, but just the, even the, the things that we're, we're fighting against, you know, it's multiple, uh, how would I say this, uh, multi-layered and, uh, and so I see all this, you know, we need, it's time to see change, it's time to see change. A and yet there's very little talk about what that change is and, and what it looks like. And, and so AJ, I'm gonna start with you. You cover a lot of these riots and stuff and, and people are asking for change. What do you think, what needs to change? What are they looking for? Well, you know, it, that's, that's an interesting question because I don't speak for everybody. Sure. I don't speak for all black people, I don't speak for all people. But from what I can see when I'm out there, you know, you know, walking with, with, with demonstrators, when, I, when I'm seeing, um, you know, confrontation with, with demonstrators and, and police, and, and when I'm seeing people even coming together as I did for, for most of yesterday, um, I think change, change means working together. I think it means reaching across the table um, in a way that is not just being angry. And there's a lot of anger and frustration and confusion um, right now. And, you know, I'll, I'll say, you know, with the events that have transpired over the past three weeks now, um, that anger is justified. That frustration is justified because it wasn't just the past three weeks. It's been, it's been ongoing. It's been ongoing for decades. Um, but I think the, the thing that people need to think about, all people need to think about, um, is when I'm done being angry, you know, what does that change look like? When I'm, when I'm done being angry, you know, at someone for the color of their skin or someone behind the badge or in uniform, I'm still gonna have to work with you. I'm still gonna be forced at some point in my life to interact with you, someone who's completely different from me, someone who um, by virtue of a badge has authority over me, someone who, you know, you know, is kind of lumped into a group that you know, now we have this preconceived notion that this is how you're supposed to act or this is how I'm supposed to act. We're gonna have to be forced to be near each other after this. Um, and so while I'm seeing a lot of anger, I think we need to say, now how do I learn to live with you? How do I learn to live amongst you? How do I learn not just to tolerate you, to, but to embrace you? And um, I don't see as much of that happening right now, but I think first people need to be finished with being angry, with being confused. Wow, that's good. Julia? Change, you know, change. In order to change, there has to be a realization that something needs to be different, that there's something wrong that needs to be changed to become something different. And in our nation, we understand that some, a lot of people do understand that there is something systematically wrong with our country. But we also need to realize that some things that are wrong don't, those things that are wrong do not affect every single person, every citizen of this country. And one of the things that, that we tend to forget, or we tend to overlook, is that this country wasn't built for everyone. It wasn't created for everyone. You know, when they talk about we the people of the United States and the Constitution was written, even the Declaration of Independence, 
that it was written for a very small group of people, white landowning men. It took hundreds of years for women to gain the right to vote. It took hundreds of years for African Americans to be recognized as citizens. And even once they were recognized as citizens of the country, it took another 150 years in order to gain equal rights as everyone else. So it, things don't, change doesn't happen overnight. And people talk about, say, will say, nothing good ever comes out of violence. Well, the Declaration of Independence was written, was signed July the 2nd, 1776. We fought a war to gain that independence. So I'm not saying we go, we're gonna go out and fight a war to gain equality, but protests is getting that conversation started, so now it's time to put it to action. What's the action that comes once we stop being angry? What are the laws that will be changed once we stop being angry? And the knee-jerk reactions that we have to the events, because that's what's happening now, knee-jerk reactions. And we're trying to get ahead of those knee-jerk reactions, but we have to realize that there are policies that don't benefit everyone. We, some, we, many of us do understand that. There are many things that are created in our nation that don't benefit everyone and probably will never benefit everyone. There are inequalities in many forms of life, whether it's education, the quality of education in one part of a county versus another, or in a city versus the county right outside of it. And it's going to, and people say, then a person will say, how can I as an individual make that change? Well, if you don't change, then the group of people won't change. Because what is a group of people but a group of individuals? So we as individuals have to realize that, hey, maybe there's something I'm doing that is wrong. So that the group of people may realize, hey, that maybe there's something we're doing that's wrong. And um, I would say, you know, building off of that, you know, you talk about change and what does that change look like and how do we do that? Last week when you had Charles on this stage, I was, I was watching, um, I was watching from the screen of a computer and I thought um, one of the beautiful things um, about him is that he, he chooses to protest in a very specific way. When you guys were asking him his questions, he had three main things that he's really, really about um, and, and serving his community. Uh, that was helping people get out of addiction. Um, that was stopping people from being evicted and, and putting them in a position you know, to where they didn't have to be. And that was feeding people who were hungry. You know, no matter what you guys asked him or what he said, he would revolve around those three things religiously. He was committed to it. When we see something wrong, especially now, uh, when we see what we're seeing on television or in, or in the quote-unquote media, um, a lot of us will, will comment from afar, will comment on social media, will we'll say what needs to be done, but we don't do anything about it. You know, we're waiting for someone else to do something about it. Uh, Charles is, is very inspiring because that's everything he's about. If, if he's not serving, then he's not doing his, then he's not doing his job. And, 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 and that's a job that is, that is uh, Christ-driven mm -hmm. for him. Um, and so when you, when you think about protests, you want change. Here's someone who sees the change that needs to happen in his community. And though he may not be marching down the street or, or going up to city leaders, I mean, he's right in the thick of it every single day. Um, and so, again, when we're thinking about that change, it's like, you know, how, how are you going to be a part of that change? How do you become the change that you want to see? Um, and protesting is one way of doing it. Um, but I thought it was really powerful when, you know, hearing Charles speak and him doing another way, finding another way. No doubt that is Charles' life, uh, getting to work with him daily and watching him do what he does. Um, you, I, I think it's awesome you picked up on that because that is Charles. Um, well, it was funny, right after the conversation last week, he was on the phone helping somebody right when we were done with him. And it was like, oh, my gosh, like he's, he lives this out daily. So it's cool yeah, you that's picked right. up on as it. As soon as we prayed, yeah. before we could get off the stage, he was on the phone. Uh, somebody needed help, and, and he was reaching out to them. Um, so going back to your, to your angry, uh, what you said, um, what are you going to do 
once the anger passed. You know, yeah, everybody's angry now. I, I think of the phrase, hurt people hurt people. There are a lot of hurt people out there. And I don't think, especially white folks, I don't think we understand sometimes the depth of that, that pain. I, I think we can hurt with you. I think we're, I, I know I'm put off by the things that happen, but, but when I hear y'all stories and the things that you, I can't imagine what that's like to live with that and face to face with some of that. So, um, so I get that, but, but I love that the, the, you know, people are angry right now. And, and when you're angry, it's hard to get anything good done, but you can harness that anger is what I'm hearing you both say and, and, and use that for the good, especially on the other side of, of this. Um, and then that change piece. Yeah. Charles was like, you know, don't just wish for change. Don't just sit back and ask for change, but be change. And, and he's a, a great example of that for, for sure. Um, so you spoke to this out back or earlier. So we see a lot of signs that says Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. And then I've seen people, and, and I'll have to, I'll, I'm just all my car, you know, I look at that and I'm like, yeah, but I get that, but all lives matter. But you spoke into that out back a while ago that that was very eye-opening for me. So can you, yeah, you remember what you said? Black lives matter, all yeah. lives matter, blue lives matter. They all do. We all do. In, in the eyes of, of our creator, we were all created equal. And God created us in his own image. He didn't create one to be higher than another. He didn't create one to be lower than another. But... <laughs> it's a great example of Jesus when he gave his Sermon on the Mount. And he said, blessed are the poor, blessed are the meek. He's not saying, I love the, the poor more or I love the meek more. But he's saying right now, they need my attention. Right now, they, they need me to love on them a little bit more. Um, when, as a parent, if you have a child, they fall and, and scrape their knee and you give them attention, you're not saying, oh, I don't, I don't love my children, these other children more, or I don't love him more, or I love them less. You're saying, he, right now he needs my attention. And right now, people who are black, people who are brown, people who are a different color, they need it right now. Because if you, if you look disproportionately, more interactions with law enforcement or interactions with people, there are more people that of color that are being killed without due process. Um, and that's not saying that the police, every police officer you meet is going to be evil. No, they're not. I, I'd have plenty of police officers I, I know and love. But there's that one that, that taints the batch for everybody else, that one bad apple that makes everyone else look bad. Uh, and like AJ was saying, yeah, you can have 5,000 people together all day, have a great experience, but that one in event just taints the whole thing, the, the one bad experience. And that's where it is with Black Lives Matter, All Lives Matter. It's not saying that all lives don't matter. It's not saying that just Black Lives Matter. It's just saying that right now, people who are black, as, as we as humans see them, they need, it a little bit, they need a little bit more love and attention right now. And that's not to say we won't be saying someone else 10 years from now, you know, lives matter. But right now, in this instant, 2020, black lives are, are right now are the focus and, and need to be because of the events that have occurred and we keep seeing occur. Now it's being recorded and being broadcast. Yeah, and um, I'll, I'll say to that, uh, Julian, um, you know, my mom, she has a, a phrase for that too. She says, um, you know, for every 12, they're the Judas. Yeah. You know, getting from to get back to that kind of Christian perspective of it, um, and you know, especially when we're when we're out there, you know, we're we're going Facebook Live or we're showing the reports, and we'll see the comments coming at us in real time, and you'll see a lot of those, you know, comments that are like "All lives matter," and like you said, and I think everyone on this stage agrees, everyone in this church agrees, all lives do matter, absolutely, but you know, just as Jesus said, if you do this to the least of these, then you're doing it for me. If all lives matter, then when you see some of the, you know, acts of brutality, again, that's not all police, but it, but it happens, it, and it happens a lot. And when you see that, if it doesn't make you angry, 
or, or upset, if it doesn't make you want to do something about it, then how can all lives matter, you know? If, if all lives truly do matter, then when you see your brother hurting, when you see a people hurting, how can you, how can you be okay with that? How can you say all lives matter and, and let that continue to happen? And so I think, again, as, as you said, right now, there, there is a group of people that really need that attention. They need those issues. They need this problem of racism addressed because it's not the past three weeks. This is just the first time we've been faced with it the loudest. You know, this is, again, um, a problem for hundreds of years, you know. Yeah, that was, that was, when you said that out back this morning, we were talking, that was very insightful and eye-opening for me because and maybe part of it's the pastoral side of me, you know, yes, black lives matter, but all lives matter, mm -hmm. you know, but, but that helped me understand that in a way that I don't think that I ever had. Um, because you are right, you know, use the example of, you know, I got two boys. If one of them gets hurt, the one that's hurt is the one who needs most of my attention right now. And, um, and so I, I really appreciated that. That was, that was very insightful for me. So it's, it's not that other lives don't matter. It's just that we're hurting and, and we need some help. Um, and, I, and I think that was a phrase you even used out back a while ago because I, I remember writing that down. We need, we need your help mm -hmm. is specifically what you said. So uh, under, uh, with that, if there, was, um, if there was something that you could say to white folks in general, um, what would it be? Now I'm going to turn that around. Let's say it to black folks as well. But well, I but. think I will put it put it, put them together. Okay. Um, we were all created by by one God. We all serve the same God. We all serve. We all pray to the same Savior, and we're all indwelled in by the same Holy Spirit. We need. We have to realize as Christians that we are a family. We have the same Father. We have the same brothers, we have the same sisters. We're all of one body. So if one part of your body is hurting, then your entire body hurts. If, uh, like yesterday, I was out working in the yard and I cut my hand, but yeah, I didn't say, oh, you know, my hand, my whole body hurt because, and, and, and Jude will be the first one to tell you, he, he's got aches all over it. I, I hurt, I hurt, it's, you know, that's his thing. It's like when a part of us hurts, our whole body should hurt. And right now, our brothers, our sisters are hurting, whether it's because of X, Y, Z. It doesn't matter why they hurt. It's just because they do. So we should hurt too. Um, it doesn't matter what, if, if I tan better than the next person, uh, if, I, if I'm a little bit darker than the next person or lighter than the next person, it doesn't matter. We're all created equal. And that's what our nation was supposed to be formed on. All men are created equal. And, you know, men, women, humans. But... It hasn't been that way. And, but we also realize that all these things were created by man, not God-driven. God didn't place us to be here masters over others, other than the animals. We were created to be equals amongst each other. So just because Trey and I look different, just because Jeff and I look different, AJ and I look different, doesn't mean I'm higher or lower than them. I mean, I'm taller, but I'm not <laughs> higher or lower than you. But I love you just as much as I love you. And I love our, our music team. Everybody on the music team looks different than each other. That doesn't mean we love each other more or less. Um, and, and I guess similar um, to what you said, Julian, I don't, know if, I don't know if I can say anything specifically you know, to white folks or black folks because, again, we, we are all in this together. But I will say, I will say, um, that we are really, really, really hurting right now. And again, it's, it's more than just the, the, the issues at hand. I think that, you know, a lot of times we try to focus on what makes us really different. And while our differences are worth celebrating, they're certainly not worth hating each other or, or treating each other you know, differently for. Um, I, I think what I would say, you know, to both groups 
and, and everyone else in between, no matter what color you are, um, is that we all have, um, you know, a shared history, you know, together. What, what some people revere, you know, others are terrified by, intimidated by. Both things are true. Um, but like I said earlier, it's how, how, okay, we know that. What do we do, you know, to work together? I'm still going to live in, in, in the same neighborhoods around you, near you. I'm still going to walk the same streets as you. You know, when are we going to be done, you know, focusing on, focusing on each other's skin? Um, and there's a lot of anger and frustration, a frustration associated with that. And I think we do that by really addressing the problem at hand that's dealing with race, that's dealing with economics, it's dealing with schools. And I would say to both groups, we need to really try our best to reach across the table touch someone, walk with someone, trade shoes, look at where someone else lives, go on someone, sit on someone else's porch, right? Really, really, you know, sit and see it from their perspective. Uh, that's what I would tell, you know, and again, I don't speak for everybody, but it, it's certainly how I try to live my life, you know, no matter who I come across, and I come across a lot of different people, um, but I try to meet them where they're at and help them get where they're going. And we all need to do that for each other. This porch thing's becoming a, <laughs> inter so, so I, Charles brought that, he reminded me of that last week because I asked him, I said, you know, so when are you gonna come to church? And he goes, when are you gonna come to the hood? And, and so when I went, we sat on his front porch and, uh, and people came and went and, you know, and I'm, I'm the white guy sitting there. And you can tell when people walk up, they're like, you know, who is this guy? They, I think they thought I was the police or something. I don't know. But, uh, um, and, and then so we were out back talking, and, and I, I said something about, man, I'd love to hear more. And he said, and Julian, yeah, Julian says, yeah. come, sit on my porch. come sit on my porch. So uh, guess so, what uh, porch I'm going to be sitting on next? Yeah. <laughs> His wife, Brooke, doesn't know we're coming over for dinner tonight. Yeah. So. Fire up the soon. grill or whatever. Yeah. So, um, well, I, I appreciate Man, I appreciate you guys being real and, and sharing. Um, and we're just scratching the surface of this. But uh, again, I think f for me right now is what I'm taking away from our conversation now as well as uh, just a few moments we got together was that understanding the Black Lives Matter piece. People are hurting. Hurt people hurt people. Um, hurt people do things that they wouldn't normally do. And, and then the other piece of that is, you know, what's it going to be like on the other side of our anger? What are we going to do different? You know, what are we going to, to do with that? You know, like you said, we still got to live with each other. We still got to, you know, so, so what, how's that going to be different? So here, here's maybe the last question I have for you at this moment. Um, we're all followers of Christ. I know y'all's testimony and, and, um, and we serve God together. What do you think God thinks of all of this that's going on in our country? I mean, even last night, uh, another black man was gunned down by a white police officer. So that started a whole nother round of, of not just um, protests, but riots. And, uh, and, and then there was potentially an incident in Richmond last night. At the end of, you said, what was a great day, you covered that all day long yesterday, and, and then maybe it's it, it's going to get you know smeared. By might this might one take us back a few but, steps. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, so so for us as a church, and maybe it's a, and maybe not so much what is God, but where does the church fit into all of this? Well, I, th I think actually one, probably one of the best things that could have happened right now is you know the church has left the building. Um, you know the church has stopped being. You know, we have to stop being the building and, and be the church. And, you know, we have, when we see injustice, we have to, we have to speak up about it. Whether it's something small, I mean, it could be just the way you feel that a, a server is treating a, a patron. It could be something simple of, 
hey, why'd you hold the door for them and not them kind of thing? Or, or it, it could be any, it could be small things. I mean, the big things are small things just in bigger packages kind of thing. Um, we, we have to be the church. We have to be the, the loving body of Christ that Jesus wants us to be. Um, there, there's no other way around it. Uh, Jesus gave us two simple basic commands to follow because there, there, so, there were so many that there was no way that you could follow all of those. So Jesus narrowed it down to two. We have to love each other. We have to love our neighbors as we love each other, as we love ourselves. I mean, there's no other way. We have to love them as we love Christ. We have to follow the Lord our God, and we have to love each other. I mean, it bears down to those four simple letters, L-O-V-E, love. You know, there's, that's, that's really all I have. Um, and I, I guess I see um, where I see the church in all of this is, uh, you know, again, I've been thinking a lot about you know, talking with my colleagues, talking with people on the streets, talking with demonstrators and city leaders and being in the thick of it. Um, it's interesting, you know, we have an, a unique perspective um, as, as followers of Christ. And to me, um, I guess I'll say it this way, when I see people acting so passionately ab about, about certain things, um, whether in this church or not in this church or out on the street, I say, okay, well, what are you, what are you first? Are you, are you white? Are you black? Or are you American? You know, that's something that we all have in common. And then taking it to the, to the church perspective, are you an American first or are you a Christian first? Right? I think that in itself will help a lot of people figure out what is right to do. Just as Julian said, you know, we, we need to treat others the way we want to be treated, but you know, something that we brought up in our previous conversation, something that my brother told me a while back, he said, there's the golden rule, treat others the way you want to be treated. But then he said, there's also what you could consider the platinum rule, which is to treat others better than the way you want to be treated. That's, now that's a, that's a mighty task of anybody. But I think as followers of Christ, we're, we're called to do it. If you really, really broke it down to something that simple, then the answer is obvious. So, you know, then, then there is no gray area. It's when you see something right or wrong, it, it stops becoming a race issue. It stops becoming an economic issue. It, it starts becoming a right or wrong issue. And I think as followers of Christ, um, it may be harder than it looks, but, um, or seem harder than it looks, but it's actually quite simple when you break it down to what's right, what's wrong. How do I, how do I be the church out there and help the people who are hurting feel better? Well, I love that rule that you said out there, and I'm so glad that you mentioned it here because I think that helps sum up what we as Christians should be doing, but also how we can help one another during this time. Because I think a lot of people think, oh, I can just love God. And it's like, well, if you love God, you should love the people he created as well, not just the people that you're comfortable with. And then also to love your neighbor. And I think all of us think, well, yeah, I love the person next to me or people like me, but to love your neighbor as yourself, that's people that you don't know, people that you don't associate with, people that you are uncomfortable with. And to, like you said, go across the table, spend time with people that you're uncomfortable with and get uncomfortable during this time because that uncomfortable spirit will lead to change as we continue to embrace that. And I just thank you guys for, for sharing today. I thank you for your hearts. And ultimately, I, I'm just glad to have you in my life as well. It's just really cool to see what you guys do for the church, but also um, just the men that you both are and the way you represent yourselves and just being open and willing to share today is just really cool. So thank you guys for doing that. I, I hope people get as much out of this as we've gotten out of this um, before this and even during this time. Yeah, um, the platinum rule. That'll preach. Yeah. I'm just saying. <laughs> That's our um, next series. Yeah. <laughs> the platinum so rule. So when he said that out, outside when we were talking, it was like, wow. That, and I think that does bring this home. You, know, you said it boils down to four letters and then you, L O V E, and you said, and that's all I got, you know, but, but that's all we need. Hmm. You know, if we just started there, if we just loved 
each other the way Christ loved us. Um, and, and that's what we're called to do. And, and so I want to echo what Terry, one of the things I do know about you guys, um, everything that I know about you, is that you are Christian first. Um, and it shows in what you do. It shows in the way you serve here at our church. It shows in the way that you live your life. I, I watch you and your family, um, you and Lauren. Uh, I, so thank you for being that example in that. Um, you know, if, if I could say I'm sorry for the hurt that, that you guys feel, then um, I, I just feel like in some ways that's so shallow to say that. But but I do, uh, I, it, I do hurt when I, especially when I hear specific things like that, it, that you guys have shared and, and what happens and, and um, it does make me angry. And, and, and I hope it makes all of us angry, to be honest with you, because we can't say we're Christians and not be hurt by what happens uh, to these guys or anybody else for that matter. Uh, we can't say that we love God and not love uh, people who are different from us and not love, you know, and I've said this, you know, as our relationship goes with God, so goes our relationship with each other. And, our, and honestly, as our relationship goes with each other, so goes our relationship with God. Because I can't say, you know, I love God and then have, you know, something in my heart against these guys or, or Trey or, or my spouse for that matter. And, um, and, and so we are called to love. And, and, and I, I do think that Christ went above and beyond the golden rule, and that is to, to love others better than you love yourselves. And, uh, and, and so may we all step up to that challenge this week. And may we all get uncomfortable and have the hard conversations, and may we listen more than we talk. Um, I think that would be huge, just to hear what others are going through and, and try to understand where some of this is coming from. Uh, people are hurt, and, and they need a way of expressing that. And no doubt we can go too far with that, and, and, uh, and we would all agree with that. But, but understand where that's coming from, and, 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 and I think the other piece in that would be for us to look to be the change. You know, not just to expect change, not just to ask for change, but be willing to, to be that change on the other side of our anger. Um, and, and we're all angry in this for different reasons and, and, and coming at it from different angles. But on the other side of this anger, what, you know, we still got to live with each other. So what is that going to look like? How's it going to be different um, on the other side of this? And uh, so thank you both for the challenge today in that. And uh, Julian, I was wondering if I could ask you to close our time in prayer. Would you do that sure, for us yeah. today? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for this day. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity. Father, we thank you for the privilege to come together to worship you. Father, we live in a country where we are, we are, are, are free, but that freedom came at a cost. But Lord, we also thank you and praise you that we live in a country where we are free to worship you as we see fit. Father, we, I thank you for this opportunity that uh, of Trey and, and Jeff and AJ and I to come together and speak. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity just to be alive, Lord. Um, Father, it's, it's a difficult conversation, and I know you're probably, probably so sad uh, about it, that your, your creation, your people, your children are hurting. But Lord, we know that seeking you is, is the answer to it all. Um, Father, help us to have those conversations. Help us to have the conversation, but also to take the action, to, to go to the next step. Uh, help us to understand that, that our, our siblings are, are hurting. Help us to understand that some of our siblings are uncomfortable. Some of our siblings are angry and, and sad. Lord, help us to be there for them, whether it's just physically being there, whether it's a conversation, whether it's, it's prayer, whether it's, it's a hug, a handshake, a smile. Um, but Lord, we, we love you. We praise you. We thank you. And Lord, help us to be the lights for you and your kingdom. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, thanks for being a part of today's conversation. Love you guys, and we look forward to seeing you next week. 
We hope this message will help you explore, experience, and express God's grace and truth for your life. If Atley Church has made a difference in your life or you have questions about today's message, we'd love to hear from you. Simply email us at stories at atleychurch.org. Check out our website for more information about small groups, upcoming events, and how you can help financially support Atley Church so that we can continue to share messages like this one. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe so that you can receive new podcasts every week. You can also find our podcast on iTunes. Thanks again and hope to see you next Sunday.